Aloha, Daniel Molina here. Thank you for tuning in today. I can't wait for you guys to hear. You, a lot of you guys already know about this guy, and he has the same name as I do. And he has seven children. Have you figured it out yet? His name is Daniel Anthony. Daniel, my brother, welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah, you. Awesome. So the reason I wanted you to come here is because you have so much wisdom, so much knowledge in the area of farming, sustainability, and culture, and just being a you know, Hawaiian practitioner and just understanding um, the legacy and everything around that. And so tell me a little bit first, because a lot of people know you on this island and some people watching don't know you. So tell them a little bit about, I would say in three minutes, like your upbringing, how'd you grow up and where um, from, you know, where you're born to where you are today. You know, I think we all are, are uh, residual of our ancestors. Uh, I am, you know, blessed to, to represent so many different nationalities. Um, my mom was born in Fiji. My dad was born in an Air Force base in Japan. You know, I, I think part of what makes me tick is the fact that I have like internal battles between the cultures, you know. Um, my grandfather, my dad's side is the firstborn uh, in the United States of Austrian, Hungarian, Jewish ancestry. Um, our family fled Austria uh, at the beginning of the war and it was the only surviving family of our Jewish line. Oh, wow. um, my grandmother, who he married, uh, survived the firebombing of Tokyo City at age 13. Um, that's my dad's parents. My mom's parents, uh, my grandfather, um, was the illegitimate grandson of the governor of Fiji. And my grandmother uh, was a Fijian of Lawin ancestry. So back in those days, it was really, really, really not common for the Fijians and the Indians to marry. My grandfather was, was also East Indian. Um, and in 1959, my grandfather led a very successful campaign um, to strike the kerosene drivers union. And uh, it began the destabilization of British ruled Fiji. Uh, in 1959, the strike that he created um, basically got him kicked out of the country. So in some aspects, I guess I could say I'm a refugee. Wow. Um, my grandfather took his three children, my mom, my aunt, and my uncle, and came to Hawaii. There he entered the UH school system, uh, married, remarried, very prominent Hawaiian educators. Um, and my grandfather itself is, is a, an incredible story. Um, my parents met young. My mom, although you would think going from Fiji to Hawaii would have been a plus, She's the type of person that really needed a village and so easily fell into drugs and alcohol and sort of the social life of someone running away. Uh, my mom abandoned me at one. Uh, my dad basically um, was told by my grandfather, my, his dad, like, you gotta, this is your kid, you gotta take care of him. Um, my dad raised me out in Waianae where he fell in love with um, a clerk at 7-Eleven. And she happened to be the daughter of the last taro farmer in the valley. Wow. My sister was born when I was three. Uh, I was raised in the household of the last taro farming family. Wow. Although I am not of Hawaiian ancestry, uh, the kupuna that raised me uh, where Mauna Leo from Waianae grew up farming and fishing um, and were really the ones that were caught in all of the changes as far as diet, water access. I lived in the last house that had water access mm. and I watched the taro patches that ran for 800 years wither. Mm because of the lack and loss of that water access. Um, so that was my stepmom's family. In Waianae, my dad's dad, the first 
Austrian Hungarian Jewish born in our family in America uh, becomes a doctor goes to war meets my grandma goes back to college in Pennsylvania is the 1959 valedictorian of Thomas Jefferson Medical School. Oh, wow. Literally had his pick of any medical facility in the world. Chose to come to Hawaii. Uh, he was, my grandfather, who passed away recently, um, was a activist of activists. Um, from a youngest age, I've been protesting, uh, organizing, community organizing, my grandfather ended up being the first resident, the first director of the Wainai Coast Comprehensive Health Center. And there he worked for almost 50 years. Um, so I grew up in kind of this split world where one world was like, I was watching it die. And in this other world, this medical world, I was watching the medical world grow. Mm to save the dying one. Wow. So, you know, I, uh, like many of my classmates growing up that went to White and I, um, was, got totally caught up in the game of stuff. Um, and made a lot of not healthy, wise decisions well before I was 18. And so that life time ago, helped me to make better decisions in my adulthood. Yeah, right about 18, I almost committed suicide and came to the realization that if I'm going to live, I'm going to live for something. Mm. What, yeah. what brought you to that point where you were like, I'm, I'm done with life? You know, I think, it's, I think it's everything from not having a vision of where I was going to not really liking who I, I was thinking that I was becoming or had become. Um, you know, I think there's so much built around external features of life. I'm a late bloomer. Yeah, I look like a 12 year old till I was like 29. <laughs> same, <laughs> same here about it, same here about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, you know, all of the insecurities that go with being a late bloomer. Um, I always have been surrounded by incredible people. I mean, just my own family are people that are workaholics, mm -hmm. that have a vision, that are passionate about how they live and what they do, that stand up for what is right. These are just the, the general, you know? And so we always, and I say we, I say human nature is to rebel. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be in the best situation, have the best of everything, and still figure out how to not be happy and rebel. Mm. So I didn't value what I had. So then so then what what was that moment? You said you had a moment. What brought you to your senses to say, whoa? This is how crazy it was. <clears throat> I was not doing good things. I was caught up in all kinds of drama. I was super duper depressed. I was like literally living in the bushes, but between my aunt and uncle's house on the big island. And one day I was sitting down and my uncle looked at me and he goes, Daniel, on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate yourself today? And I was just so low. I was just like, I started crying and I just ran out and wow. I ran in the bushes. And I had a... Pretty much like a makeshift base camp in Kilka. This is pre Koki Frogs, pre Little Red Fire Ant. And I had my friend had given me a little takedown 22 and I put it together and I was like, you know, why are you wasting space on this planet? Like, what is your reason to live, Daniel? Mm. And at almost 18 years old, I actually had zero. Hmm. And the reason I didn't commit suicide is really because of my grandma, my Japanese grandma. Yeah, and I'm the oldest son of her oldest son. And my grandma would do anything for me. And I actually visualized someone telling my grandma 
that her grandson had committed suicide. Mm. And I couldn't do that to my grandma. Wow. And that was really like the moment in life where I feel like I pushed off the bottom. Yeah, I've spent a whole lifetime, you know, that was almost 30 years ago, you know, and I, I don't, I'm still swimming towards the light. Yeah. You know, but that was my, that was my bottom. Wow. And you got out. So, so then you don't, obviously you press forward. And so I remember speed up a little bit uh, on the, on, I remember, you know, seeing that you were on Ted, did a Ted talk. You were this activist. You saw the activist in front of you and you saw farming. So what I first did, right. Is I came back to Oahu. I got a job. I tried to go to college. In college, I took Hawaiian language. And I had grown up in a household where Hawaiian was used. I took a little bit in high school. In college, shout out to Akela Kaneopio Crozier, my, my teacher at Leeward. Um, she said something to me in class. She said something in class that was basically like, although Hawaiian is the state language, you can't use it anywhere. And that it is our job to push the levels of Hawaiian language use. And somewhere in that period, I um, was driving to school one day with my friends in the car. And uh, there was a cop that had pulled up next to me at a stoplight. And um, long story short, I ended up getting pulled over, speaking exclusively in Hawaiian to the cop. The cop pulled me out of my VW bus through my window, slammed me with my friends in the car, telling me that how could I get a driver's license if I can't speak English, of which I'm responding in Hawaiian, that I don't have to speak English. This is a, you know. So he tells me, if I speak English, he'll let me go. And my friends in the car in Hawaiian are like, this is like 45 minutes standoff on the side of the oh road. Oh my gosh. So I speak English and the cop writes me a ticket. So I go to court and um, I introduce myself in Hawaiian and the judge says, we don't have time for this bullshit and dismisses my case. Wow. And so that started like my, my hobby for the next seven years. I regularly got traffic infractions to go to court. And the first few times they, they just dismissed it. But then the third time I went to court, it was the judge from the first time. And he was like, Oh, you want to play? And by this time I had like, I was racking them, you know, uh, full took off license plate. Like they, the last thing they got me for was like three grand in violations. Mm. And because of that number, it ended up taking five years of that case before they brought in an interpreter. So literally my hobby was, cause after I got out of college, I only spent two years and I went to the workforce. Like I literally would take jobs and be like, oh yeah, but I got this one hobby and sometimes I got to go to court. <laughs> and if you want me to work for you, <laughs> you gotta just know that this is just how it is. So I've been arrested multiple times in Hawaiian. Um, at this point, I have... And, and what was... Obviously, I know your goal, but let's just hear it from your mouth. What was your goal with that? Like, why were you so adamant about speaking Hawaiian and then respecting or... or Like, what was, what was your point of that? Or what was the point you were trying to drive? You know, I think, I think partially um, it's that, that personal call to, to action within myself you know you can actually go to this is this is the thing that makes it crazy what is the court system online court system data what, what's the web address for the online court system it's ecourt.cocoa and if you go to that you can look my name up and all the way back to 1996 the court system has documented yeah their treatment of me solely for the use of Hawaiian language. 
Now, the multiple points that I proved in court is one. Yeah? So you get these guys that go to court and fight in Hawaiian, but they get degrees. So the court can prove that they pass English 100, that they are English competent. But it just so happens in college, I failed English 100 twice. <laughs> Mostly because I never went class. <laughs> <laughs> but I can prove in their system that my mind is diverse. And justice has to incorporate diversity. Mm. Yeah? It's good. So the, the, for me, the battle is for the uneducated, yeah? Who's raised in a Hawaiian-speaking family, who uses Hawaiian terminologies on a regular daily basis. To go into a court system that only exists in English is immediate discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I saw while doing this was the absolute lack of justice in the justice system. Yeah, I literally have been handcuffed and put in a jail cell for refusing to speak English. And what they would do is see, this is the thing. I figured out the strategy of the court system. Now when I go in there, they don't even know what to do. Because <laughs> I, I got them so strong arms, right? Today, if you see me go to court, this is the reality. As I'm strapping up my model in the parking lot, I am pouring on myself at least a half gallon of coconut oil. Yeah, because everybody, like, get frisky. <laughs> yeah, they, like, make aggressive. So, oh, gang, we're going aggressive. I'm going to get slippery and ready. <laughs> um, literally, the last time I was at the Kaneohe District Court, they're trying to tell me I can't go in the court in my model. And I tell them, you seen the statue of Kamehameha in front of the court with the broken paddle and his model? You better wake up, buddy. Yeah? Because um, in these situations, you really have to assert yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so I show up prepared to assert myself in a very non-violent but very assertive manner yeah yeah now i bring a kahili because i have had ancestors in my life that have passed and i i want them to be there with me i also bring my secret weapon my thermal flask of hot tea <laughs> because in the court system it's freaking freezing yeah yeah so when you've got a malo on <laughs> rock hard nipples and you're sipping your hot tea, making like, it's 96 degrees in the shade. You're just chilling like a villain. It's a degrees. psychology thing. Yeah. And of course, with the last name Anthony, first name Daniel, I'm top five mm -hmm. every time. So I use that to my advantage because what would happen in the past is I would go up, introduce myself in Hawaii, and the court system would say, oh, this is going to be complicated. We're going to move you to the end of the docket. So then I'd be there at 8 o'clock. They'd call me at 8.15, and then they would clear the whole courtroom out, call me back at 3.30, continue on behalf of the state. I figured out the strategy. Yeah, they, they tell me that. I turn around and go, I call my kako. Oh, it's going to take a few more minutes, but you guys okay. Everybody nods. I turn around and proceed, Your Honor. Wow. This is how the courts... Then what did they do? Oh, 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 continue on behalf of the state. Mm. What I realized in these years is that the state of Hawaii has been operating under the guise of Hawaiian proficiency since 1978. That the court system is a system in Hawaii that is directly built off of the Hawaiian Kingdom courts where everything is in English and Hawaiian. That, you know, when it says that, that you're going to be judged by your peers, if you only can speak English, you're not my peer. Mm. Yeah, if the judge is an English only speaking judge, he actually doesn't have the legal capacity to implement justice. This is why I do this. Mm. Yeah. I, 20 something years of this battle, I actually qualify for a constitutional disability where I have had, I have been obstructed in finding justice because I have chosen to implement my constitutional rights. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't a Hawaiian thing. 
if America, is, if this is America, and in our constitution, there's two official languages, then the court system needs to be proficient yeah. in both languages. Because this is what I found out. The reason there were no Hawaiian language interpreters is solely for the sake that interpreters are provided for foreign languages. Why would you need an interpreter for your own damn official language, your honor? If you do not understand the official language, the official judicial language, you need mm. to recuse yourself. Yeah. Yeah, once you start to undermine the justice system with actual justice. Yeah, I believe I probably will be one of the first peoples to get served the sentence from a Hawaiian-speaking judge. I don't want to say I look forward to that day, mm -hmm. but it's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've organized community events for almost the last 20 years now. And two years ago was the first time I had my, I file all my permits in Hawaiian. The first time I ever had a response from the city and county in Hawaiian. Oh, wow. So, Hawaiians are out there. Hawaiian speakers are out there. They are implementing this system. It's not that the system doesn't have the capacity to provide this. It's just they simply haven't done it. Right. And it's not about, you know, I mean, we, I introduced legislation to have all the street signs in English and Hawaiian. Because if we truly are a dual language state, nation, then all the signs should be in English and Hawaiian. And what happens when you see everything in two languages? How does your proficiency improve? Right. Right? If there is a line at the bank for Hawaiian speakers, is that going to be the fast line or the slow line? Right. In the beginning, going to be the fast line. So you're going to have an advantage. Right. Which is what we need to give the language in order for it to thrive into the future. And I remember growing up here in the 87 and 92, a lot more people spoke Hawaiian. I hear it in the stores. I heard it everywhere. And so we've, you know, it's 30 years later, and I hardly ever hear anybody speaking Hawaiian, ever. And, and so what you were saying is by you seeking justice, standing your ground, is to, is to almost check the court system. Say, hey, you're trying to come here with this authority and, and, and then, and then um, charge me for whatever, but you're not even following your own, you know, principles, regulations. On, on allowing for Hawaiian, right? And so it's, it's like they're ignoring, they're, like it's, they're not respecting the language. I've had two kids go and get their driver's license. And I told both of them, they take the test in Hawaiian, I've helped them buy a car. The forced assimilation of standing out is so great that both of my daughters decided to do the test in English. Yeah, partly because the test in Hawaiian includes vocabulary that they're not familiar with. There isn't a study guide for the Hawaiian. So although they offer it, there really isn't a pathway to use it. Because it assumes all of these things that currently are not necessarily available in that format. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about driving in cars. Well, we need to be able to have the test in Hawaiian, the study in Hawaiian. We need to be able to have the, the guy taking the test do it in Hawaiian, right? To me, these are all the opportunities of how we're going to get cultural-based mindsets into the government. And it's true because when I lived in Texas, the second language was Spanish. Everything from, the, from when you call a company, they say, if you want to speak Spanish, hit two, right? They every, like, in fact, the bilingual people got paid more than the people who only spoke English. So it was respected and honored, but, but go ahead. Let me tell you something screwed up. Department of Land and Natural Resources does not have the capacity to translate and use Hawaiian language in their system. That my permit just gets placed on the side for weeks, months, years, undone because they don't have the capacity, but they're the guys that are managing our land and our natural resources. 
So it's a very, it, it's very clear to me where their mindset is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the very type of like institutional change that we're trying to live because let me tell you, I didn't have kids when I started fighting for Hawaiian language rights. I have kids that are fluent in Hawaiian. Yeah. It's not that my daughters couldn't take the test in Hawaiian. They just didn't feel like the environment made it safe for them mm. to do it. You know, my prayer is that their guilt for not doing it in Hawaiian will push them to do great things in Hawaiian mm. in their life as an adult. Mm. Yeah, that they're not, my kids don't come from a genealogy of playing it safe. <laughs> yeah. These, these, the guy, first guys for Chotara. Yeah. <laughs> um, But they're also, I believe, today we have to be very strategic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've that, been around your kids. They're they're excellent. They're hard workers. They respect. Uh, you've done very well with them. Uh, and so let's segue into, because it's, it's, <laughs> what people don't realize is we're talking about language, and language is so important. And language is so important because it's, in essence, what's protecting the culture. Um, for me, uh, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. And we, it's hard to teach our kids Spanish because most of their friends speak English. Where I grew up, most of my friends speak Spanish and English, so it was easier for us to, to speak Spanish because, you know, most of the people in the community, we were Puerto Ricans. And so it kind of stuck with us. And the parents, my wife's parents, made her speak Spanish. My parents, somewhat. So she's very fluent and she can read and write. Where I can understand, I can speak, but I can't really write and I can sometimes read it. But I can still have a conversation. And so when the culture does not allow room for the language, you also miss the culture. And so what I mean by that is like when, when your parents are not forcing you to speak the language that, of your heritage or the, or the area that you live in, then you're not wrapped up in your culture. So I know for me, when I speak Spanish, you know, there are certain things that we do as Puerto Ricans that are is different than if you were, um, you know, an American or if you were Hawaiian or if you're whatever country, right? And so for me language is so important to protect because everything stems from that culture even some of the stories of hawaiian culture right that was in that's hard to 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 ex express in english there's not english words for certain things that hawaiians say is that true is that that you feel like that resonates as far as like language being so important there's 400 terms for rain mm -hmm. you know hundreds of terms for wind it's very specific it's very scientific it's very visual. It's a language that paints a picture, a very specific picture of what's happening, when it's happening, who it's happening to, that, you know, I think, I think it's really about capacity. And if you don't have the capacity to understand the language of the place that you live in, you are naturally disconnected to some point mm -hmm. you can do everything in that culture but if you don't practice in the language you don't actually understand why you're doing it yeah and and in the languages there's there's secrets yeah yeah and and that's what we're trying to unlock here in our life are are what are these secrets to to live in more abundance yeah, and, and it's it's very simplistic things. You know, uh, let's tie this to poi. So there's a manuscript of poi making, right? But it's in Hawaiian. So people read it, they cite it, but because they weren't making poi, they didn't know that it was out of order. I came from a poi making perspective that when I got the manuscript, I was like, holy smokes, this manuscript is amazing, but it's out of order. And when I put it in order, the Hawaiian terms were the actions. And this is the steps to making poi in a way that lasts for weeks, months, or even years. Mm. So it's like, you know, the, the context in a foreign language is i don't want to say it's impossible to get but you pass it on differently yeah 
I mean, that's like the telephone game, right? It's like once it gets translated, it misses his meeting, misses it all. So let's segue into um, the farming side. So you um, are definitely proficient in farming and sustainability. And I've seen you at the Capitol. I've seen you done TED Talks. I've seen you um, go to King Kamehameha School even, right, and taught there. Like, what is your heart behind teaching um, the generations to come about pounding, po make number one, growing poi, I mean, growing taro, pounding it, creating sustainable foods that's healthy superfoods. Tell me more about that mission for you. You know, you hang around certain people and you hang around them long enough. And um, you, you begin to understand what their dreams were. And the reality, especially in places that are occupied, yeah, we keep trying to relive the dreams of the last generation. Thing about Kahlo is that everything that the Kahlo needs is exactly the same things that the Hawaiian people and community need. Yeah, access to secure, clean water, fertile soil, right? Like, this is what the taro needs. By providing it for the taro, we, in turn, participate in that. So when we look to the future, you know, how really are these people of Hawaii going, going to stay on their land for 100 more generations, much less 100 more years? Yeah, with the price of land going up, with the disconnections of water and the water thefts all over the place. It's like, I don't say it's easier to battle for the taro than for the people, but the taro is easier to, to, to build consensus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the mission that we have for Kahlo is really a mission for people. Yeah, and, and it's, it's building that relationship to understand why you would want to stay here and struggle. Yeah, what, what makes it important? Yeah, because if it's all about this money game, then, then everybody going to just move to where they can afford to live. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll at the end of it, more. what do we have and what have we lost? Yeah, because it's like the moment you sell your house, you no longer can afford to buy it. Because after the bank take their cut and the realtor take their cut, you sold them for one million, you only got 800000 <laughs> Right. So now you can't buy another million dollar lot. So what would make you want to stay? Mm. Yeah. I asked the kids this. Moses, if there's one thing you could do a week that would help your mom and dad and your grandparents live 10 years longer, would you do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... Making point and feeding your family mm. this miracle food. Yeah, and just increasing life expectancy in our community is an incredible mission unto itself. Mm. Just to increase quality of life. Yeah, you ever been sick before, Moses? Yeah, yeah is it good? You feel, you, you like being sick? No. Yeah, our community is living in sickness. Yeah solely tied to the food that they eat and they don't even know what it's like to not live like that because they have been eating this food that is poison their entire life so you know our mission with kalo ties into health of land but really ties into health of people yeah because we need healthy people to farm the taro mm. but we need the taro to make the people healthy so it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And we live in a time period where you don't actually have to grow taro to eat it. What you have to do is support a farmer. Yeah. Yeah, and we have this so ideal, idyllic sort of like dreamy state where we think, oh, I'm just going to grow my own taro. Not knowing that it's such a complex plant that simply putting it in the ground is not enough. Right. Yeah, you, you got to have that relationship and to build that relationship take, takes years. Yeah. But you can support someone that already has that relationship who's struggling, 
who's fighting for their land, who's fighting for their water. Yeah, all those families where the grandparents die and they like sell them is because the land isn't producing food. And the people that have control over the land are sick. Mm. So when you're sick, you're not thinking about the next generation. You're thinking about your generation and how you're going to cash out now and how you're going to move Vegas and get your medicine cheaper and your food cheaper. Yeah. Not recognizing. Live simple, eat healthy, struggle. Yeah. It's, it's good to struggle. Mm -hmm. Make you strong. That's right. Yeah. And raise your kids so that they understand your meaning to the struggle. That staying on this land is so critical. And not just for Hawaiians, but indigenous people worldwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In order to really have a chance, we have to have a strong connection to our land. That's our why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The water, the land. When you know why you need to be on this land and you're willing to stand up and fight and actually work with the land to make it more abundant. Because now you healthy, you making healthy food to make the next person healthy. And I believe that our health is the first step to consciously having the capacity to move beyond where we're at. Mm. We a sick nation. And this is America. Yeah, America and sick nation get all kind of addictions. And under those addictions, We've been unable to hold our own country to justice. Mm -hmm. Not just Hawaiian language, but occupation of this, illegal that. And whose money is it using? It's used all our money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. like, is the government our parent or is it our child? Mm -hmm. We're still trying to figure it out. And how does that tie back into the health and well-being of our community and why we feel like Kalo is so important? One, it's an astringent. It actually literally pulls out impurities from your body as you eat it. Simultaneously, it's pulling out impurities from the soil and the land. Right? That's what the OI system does. It brings all the stuff from Malka, runs it through the taro patch. It uses that stuff to feed itself. The stuff that it doesn't use, it goes back into the water system, back into the estuary. That stuff is food for that system. So the impurities from above feed the kalo, which its impurities feed the estuary, which its impurities feed the deep ocean. There's all of these relationships. Maybe you could say I'm, you know, A. Daniel, it's a dream that Hawaii going to be independent. But I can't tell you guys how many dreams in this life have come to reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That in order for you to go beyond where you're at, you got to dream. Mm. And let me tell you, you dream so differently on good food. Have we not lost the capacity to dream? Because mm. our digestive system is all kapulu. It's all beaten up. So maybe our whole Kalo thing is really about dreams and giving our community the power to dream for themselves on their land, with their own food in their belly, securing their own water for future generations. Mm. And so tell me about the, so the Kalo was very much a staple food for Hawaiians and the indigenous here, but then it was replaced. And, and, and so speak about what it was replaced with and, and why that's detrimental to the Polynesians, uh, especially when it comes to diabetes. So first, let me be very clear. I'm 25% Japanese. That my family name is Tanaka, which literally means rice farmer. <laughs> I know. That in Japan, there's 30 grades of rice. One being the best, 30 being the worst. What is Calro's rice on that list? It's not even allowed in the country. Wow. Such a poor quality. It's not even recognized as rice in Japan. 
So. It's like fish. Yeah? Trying to tell me you're making tilapia poke. <laughs> you know what I'm it's saying? Warmed, yeah. In 100 years, that might be the thing. But, right. but <laughs> right. So, you know, our staple foods represent about 40% of what we consume. So, you, when you switch your staple, you impact your whole economy. Right? Rice today, as it is consumed, is a product of 1959 statehood. Because you tell me, how can anything made, grown 2,500 miles away, be cheaper than something <laughs> that grown? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How the hell the manoa lettuce more expensive than the Mexico lettuce? <laughs> yes. And it's because we don't actually pay the real cost of subsidized imported food. Yeah, I tell people that I've been saying this, I've been a broken record on this. Don't worry about the ship not coming. Be worried that you can't afford what's on the ship. Mm, that's good. Yeah, because if we really had to pay, maybe that would be not, we don't, we don't have a, we don't have a, a, a the ship's not coming a test. We have a, we're going to pay the real cost of what it is test for the next two weeks. The prices of everything in the store are going to be actually the real price that it costs to get here. And let me tell you, we be buying local. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I went hundred percent local is the only thing I could afford. Right. Yeah. Is that this occupying system? We, we basically live in a military controlled system where they use imported food and the economy of imported food against farming and agriculture, right? They use development against agriculture, right? How come agriculture is the enemy of everybody? I thought you guys needed farmers. I thought you was all hungry, but just, somehow. And they just passed a law that you can't even grow something in your backyard here, right? Didn't they just pass that? I don't even, I don't even know. I'm a criminal. I'm going to go to jail again. <laughs> right? So th these are the things that, for myself, I'm looking for deep connection and meaning in life. Yeah, my kids have really helped me adhere to a path. Yeah, because I want to be with them and I want to see their future. And it, and it has helped me to understand what my role and sacrifice is because literally I can tell you certain things that we've done have changed their future for the better. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, those are my measurements that, that yes, it does impact the community, but it, we want to do things in a way that will impact the community of the future. That's right. Because that's the ones, my kids, your kids going to be living in. Right. Yeah. So those things take time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I quit my job, everybody laugh at me. Yeah. When I go legalize poi, everybody laugh. Yeah. We do these things. We find out we saw ahead of the curb. They think it's a joke. When COVID came, I was one of the few people in my bubble, in my circle. I had a bubble. I could hide in my bubble. My bubble had food, had space. Honestly, I, I miss COVID. I like the mask. And I get to hide out. <laughs> 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 Nobody know me. I could just go in and, <laughs> and do my thing in life, you know? Uh... I like going to the beach when never have nobody. Yeah, what I realize is they need us to go to work so that there's space at the beach. That this whole system that we're currently living in has very little to do about us, about the culture, about the people. It has everything to do with all of this other shit going on in the world. Global security, corporate profit. Yeah, just imagine if you're a part of the corporations that are subsidized to supply food to Hawaii. Yeah. How straight set money that is. Yeah. It's like forever. 
they're going to need you. And then the best part about it is, because they're so far away, you didn't even give them the good. They, ha ha. I know the cracker stale, but this is the only cracker get. <laughs> we'll call them sour cracker now. It's the new thing in the way. <laughs> so, so when, when rice was introduced to Hawaii, what you're saying is it's not the good kind of rice. And it's, it's not a rice that the, the, um, this um, area of the world could metabolize for well, their... I don't think anybody, the quality of this rice is impacting people that eat rice. If you come from a genealogy that eats rice and you eat this other stuff, so nobody can. Yeah. You're not. You're not getting the health benefits yeah. that that you think are associated with that. Right. Right. So up until 1959, Hawaii had the best rice in the world. Okay, because the Japanese peasants and the the Chinese peasants that came to work the plantation, they brought their rice, and they planted it. And in 1959, we had 200 rice mills, and in 1960. All 200 out of business. Subsidized California white rice. Put every single rice mill under in one year. And because of the price, 60% drop in poi consumption. Wow. Now, if we just look at 1959 to today and we follow the health projections. Mm. Yeah. It's gone down. Oh, yeah. And it's And it's really... You know, it's, it's interesting because eating poi is a whole, it's not just a food. It's a whole different way of engaging food. Yeah. With rice, I mean, you think of rice, you get your two scoops, you get your mac salad, you get your gravy, you get your hamburger, you get your eggs, you get on massive plate and you smash them. Then you get kanak attack. You really start to, to eat your food as fuel. As fuel for energy, but fuel for health. What you want to do is you want to consume food that makes you feel good. That's right. And keeps you productive. Yeah. Yeah, so what we find when we eat the poi is one, you eat less of the meat. You need less meat. Yeah. Because what happens when you properly, and this is where we're going to get a, go down the rabbit hole a little bit, yeah? First of all, what is poi? It depends where you get it from, right? Well, let's just, let's just go back. Because what we've seen is we've seen from contact till now, the recipe has changed. Yeah. Right? And if you really put on... The Kanaka lens, right? Haloa, the Kalo, predates the Hawaiian. Yeah, it's Haloa, and then it's Haloa Ke Kanaka. So this is really important. This is really important is that this way of life, this practice, connects the Hawaiians to the rest of the planet. Yeah. Before there was a Hawaiian, there was Kalo. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is critical when you look at the why, right? And the why, when you travel by ocean in a canoe, the things that you bring have to be able to get wet. That's right. So all your seeds, all of that, unless it's a kukui nut, a kamani nut, a coconut that has a very thick husk, you pretty much can't take it right? Things that can survive as a root. So sweet potato, the vine has roots. Ulu, you can clip the root of the ulu and travel with that. Some of these things like banana has a pseudocorm that you can take that does very well. So these were the foods of the traveler. This was the fuel of the very first. I mean, they were, they were astronauts. Yeah, to jump in a vessel and go 2,000 miles over the ocean, you had to, you're tight. Yeah. I'm talking NASA tight. Right. Yeah. And so this is that food of the ancestors that the, the you know, you think of like poi, who else has it in the world? Nobody. Right. 85 countries, 2,000 varieties of taro. Why only the Hawaiians get poi? That is a good question. I never even thought about that. 
It was an advancement in food preservation technology that was kept secret. And still to today, one of the most misunderstood foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah? When you take a recipe, you change a step or an ingredient. Guess what it is no longer? It's no longer what it, you're trying to make? It's no longer the recipe. So when we think of poi from that lens, there's a very specific way to make it. When you don't make it in that way, you're making something totally different. Now, if you read up on the microbes of poi, this is what the scientists wrote. There's thousands of microbes found on the taro. We only studied the prevalent ones. But if you made the recipe wrong, wouldn't that change which ones are prevalent? Yep. So when we go to taro culture and taro eating, everyone thinks of taro farming, but they don't think of food preservation. And this is important. Because in order for a civilization to make feather cloaks, feather capes, you got to be balling in time. Yeah. Balling. Okay, I'm talking like more than like Toyotas with rims and sounds. Balling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, Auntie, you only get one gold chain. You only get 40 bracelets. This feather cloak represents the 400,000 people in my Ahupua and one whole healthy food system. The amount of time necessary to produce these types of arts require food abundance. Now, we got to think, the most amount of poi ever made, the most amount of taro ever grown, not a single drop of fossil fuels used. Mm. Yeah, that this is a recipe that does not require refrigeration. So first of all, if you're poi refrigerated, it's a poi-like product. Right. Yeah. Now we're looking at quality. Who regulates poi? It's the Department of Health. They have a definition. It says poi containing less than 27% solids. Um, poi is the unadulterated ground taro product containing no less than 27% solids. So that's 73% water. There's actually a subcategory of poi. And that's their definition, but it's not the Hawaiian definition. <laughs> no, no. This is just the Department of Health definition. This is what we went up and we had to fight when we legalized traditional poi making. Yeah. That is this mindset. There's a subcategory of poi. It's called poi ready to eat. You know, you go look the Hanale. You look everything that's refrigerated, it actually says poi ready to eat. That's not the labeling, that's the classification of what it is. And that one is only 15% taro. Oh, wow. So you buy Hanale at $10 a pound. If it's only 15% taro, that's actually $50 a pound for taro. Wow. Oh, my gosh. And also $50 a gallon for water. Some expensive water. I found uh, in research that there was a 1942 legislation on the Big Island that said poi containing less than 30% solids shall be deemed unfit for human consumption and the sale of such prohibited. Wow. So if you took the poi in the store today, back to 1942, couldn't even serve them. That's crazy. Once again, what is poi? Yeah, and I believe that for every family... Your family should have a definition of what it is. Mm. Yeah. And if that definition keeps you part to your land, keeps your water safe, keep your kids healthy, keep your grandma healthy. Yeah, if it literally keeps, sticks the family together, I like your recipe. Mm. And that's partially why in 2011, we fought to legislate and create space in the governmental rule book to allow for the traditional making of poi what i didn't realize is what happened when we did that is it legally recognized mahi ai. that there is someone out there that is growing taro that is making it traditionally that existence of a person 
wasn't recognized in the rule books. Hmm. You had to give you all of these rights that you could do, but then you couldn't really do them. Well, this is one that since 2011 has been the fastest growing sector of Hawaiian cultural practice that is equated to more people staying on the land, providing an economy yeah. that doesn't need a certified kitchen. Yeah, an economy that you can make right in your garage and sell legally. We, what we did is we created a system that you did not need a certified kitchen to legally sell poi to infinity and beyond. Yeah. Like it's in our hands to screw it up. This is why we're very strict about it because we have a very special classification. If you look at America, the traditional poi makers are the last food preparers that can touch cooked food with bare hands in America. You know, we got a battle on, on all separate fronts, mm -hmm. but the legalization took the legal liability off of the schools, the grantors, right? It, people wouldn't give money to point making projects because of the legal liability around food preparation. Right. Since 2011, 20 to $30 million has been put into the cultural community awesome. to support these programs. Right, we're looking at thirty thousand poi boards being made in a little more than the last decade. These are things that today you go to Facebook, you look up poi pounder. There's guys selling them, Papa Kuiai. There's guys selling them. These guys didn't have this is this is an economy we created a market that is uniquely a Hawaiian economy, with the majority of benefactors being Hawaiians. Outside of that, it's people that are looking for health that are looking for connection to Aina, right? This is where we're able to reuse resources that were being thrown away. So all the people that have called you crazy, that said, why are you quitting your job? What are you doing? Here's the fruit of what you fought for. Here's the fruit of what you've grown up seeing. Here's the fruit of what you saw growing up. And you saw the people, you know, burning down, in essence, the, poor, the, the kalo patches, the loi patches, and then you got, and then you got health, and then and people getting sick, and that like, we got to stop that. And so here's this ripple that you've created, and to change that paradigm, to change that where now more and more people are getting into the practice of pounding poi or pounding kalo, uh, and now you created a marketplace, a competitive marketplace, because now, you know, if you're going to sell yours at, you know. $18 a pound, this guy's going to sell it at 12 or seven or six. Now you've created a healthy, you know, um, well, this poison is, or this call is just as good, you know, so you created a, a marketplace for this, even for us as a, a company that we built was, um, I mean, we started was blended Hawaii and we use Kalo for our sorbet and that's, that's not unheard of here. And so, and we're very selective of where we buy a Kalo. We buy some from you because we know you guys have really good Kalo. And so you've created, so from your, you being an activist, for you fighting for the ability to legalize, the ability to, to make poi the way the traditional cultural, it's allowed people like us to, to work with Anthony and Michael to start a company to sell sorbet that has, has poi, has poi in it, has kalo in it because of what you've done. So that's the fruit. So people calling you crazy need to eat their own words because you had a vision, you had a dream, you drum big. And because you drum big, there's not there's now fruit from that. We are now grabbing from your fruit that you've it plowed. It takes time, you know. Um, we always talk about being ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's not usually where the profit is or the abundance. That's yeah, where the struggle. That's is. where the freaking that's the bottom <laughs> of the ship freaking yeah. smashing. Yeah, you know. Um, what we need is we need more champions that are willing to be ahead of the curb so that there can be opportunity for the culture and people to thrive. Yeah. Because the reality is that the institutions, the government, the military, they're 50, 75 years ahead of the curve. Yeah. They're beating us up into the future. We don't even know about that yet, but it's coming. Yeah. And so we need to get our community to that point where we're investing in that curve. Instead of saying you're crazy, we're saying here, this is where 
we trust that our investment is going to get this kind of crazy returns out of it. Because the truth is, the cultural value of people making their own food in this manner is the difference between this part of the culture existing and not. Mm -hmm. How do you value that? Yeah. You know, and it seems like today people don't necessarily want to give. They want to invest. They want to see a return. Yeah, so, you know, I'll tell you, there's this there's crazy Japanese guy. He married a Hawaiian woman, lives Papakolea, Hawaiian homestead. And he came to me in 2011. He said, Daniel, you need a nonprofit. And I said, Uncle Mark. I barely survived this whole legalized pot yai thing, Uncle. I'm like literally on my last leg here. Um, it's gonna cost me about fifteen hundred bucks just to submit the paperwork for a nonprofit. I don't even know where I get that from. And then I need someone to write it and this and that. And he goes, Well, you know anybody can write it? And I said, Well, my friend said if I get the money, I trade her a poi board and she'll write it for me. He whipped out his checkbook, fifteen hundred bucks right there. There you go, Daniel. This is for your nonprofit. Get it started. I expect you to get this started. And I look back at, at certain people that invested in us when there could have been a fork in the road. Mm. Yeah. Because I think that's the part that most cultural practitioners will tell you is the challenge is we really have two worlds that we're existing in. And where people feel like Hawaiian culture is supposed to be this free thing and you got to give it away. I always feel like the reason you charge is so you can give it to the right people. Otherwise, something that is solely free, people don't have value. Yeah, you don't. Yeah? Yeah. When I sold stone in the natural stone world, I realized that rich people want to brag about how much money they spent on their home. And I could help them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I would yeah. take this $1 square foot Chinese slate and by the end, it'd be a $12 a square foot <laughs> antique <laughs> slate material, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is how people associated the value of their home was with how much money they spent on it. And so we're caught up in this things that cost more have more value. But realizing like the things that have the most value, you could never buy. Right. So the culture lives in between those. Right. Yeah. And the practitioner's role is to really understand who needs to be subsidized. Right. Because, you know, 2011, I'm not sure what you were doing, but I doubt you were fighting to legalize PAI. No. Right, here we are in 2024, and like, thank heaven someone legalized it over a decade ago. So for those people that are benefactors of it, you know, how are they investing into the future for that? That's right. Yeah, I think there's so many people that don't realize all the controversy that went into that. I was getting like death threats. Like, people think today's crazy. Bro, we were shaking it up in 2011. Yeah. People couldn't even fathom how poi was illegal, much less how America, the state of Hawaii, would go legalize them, right? Like, there was just this, like, what are we going to do? And I think that if we want the next generation to have the courage, we got to figure out how to invest in that. Yeah. So, you know... Tie it back into the to the health and well being and rice and food and it's like well when you buy that rice, what are you investing in? Mm. Who are you investing in? When you get that kalo, there's a good chance that you can see a face. Yeah. Yeah. And I try to open up my fridge and look at all the faces in my fridge. And who that food represents. And if the only guy I see is the auntie at Costco, then I know that I have a lot to grow in my connection to my food system. Mm. Yeah, that everything in there actually has a face, has two hands. 
And the more that I can see those two hands and those two faces, that those are actually the people that I'm truly investing in and supporting. Mm. So on, on that point, it's also important to buy from and, and go to restaurants that also support farmers because they have they're dealing with faces, halua tomatoes, right? Um, you know, Maui onions or whatever, right? See, but when you go to that restaurant and you say where your tomatoes are from, they go, oh, this guy. And they paint you a picture right there. And then if you go to a restaurant, say, where are your tomatoes from? They go, oh, Costco. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's this totally different picture. And yeah. it's like, who are you supporting? How are you helping them to support others? So mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Going to those places that, that strive to serve local, but also knowing they're taking a risk. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the number one most profitable item on the plate lunch is? 400% markup. Rice? Rice. <laughs> the rice. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that thing that has the hugest markup has the most medical, like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. As they're selling the rice, they know the health impacts are going to equate. So they're buying futures of the medical industry. Yeah. And the person right? eating the rice thinks they're getting it cheap. But then they're spending more money on medical bills. So you pay you pay not only for that plate lunch, but in ten years you're also paying for all the pills. That so I grew up in the Wanai Coast Comprehensive Health Center because my grandpa. I, I didn't even know he was the director. Like I just thought, honestly, this is how terrible it was. I thought my grandpa. Everyone gave him respect because he was a tall white dude. It's like wow. They really do treat white people different around here. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up, I don't know how terrible that is. Yeah, yeah. But my, I didn't realize that he was this valedictorian of a Ivy League medical university. That he was like my grandpa had all the accolades. Yeah, I was just the grandson that was literally in the little baby cage with nurses changing my diapers. And what I saw, because I'd go there every day is I would see the same people in the waiting room. They'd spend hours in the waiting room. And I always thought, man, imagine you had a weeding room. And these guys were just waiting around, pulling some weeds. How that would impact how sitting down in this AC room is doing zero health while you're waiting to be looked at, yeah? And it's like, Auntie, if you hear three times a week like you know what what is this system doing what are we catering to right and the truth is we're catering to corporations yeah yeah i asked this of my grandfather i did an interview with him in 2014 i said grandpa did you make wine healthier and he kind of went like this and then he like i thought he phased off for a little bit i was like grandpa he's like no 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 i'm thinking i'm thinking how to answer <laughs> this he goes I didn't make wine healthier. I helped them deal with their pain better. Yeah. And that's really what modern medicine has become. It has become a pain management system. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole goal is to perpetually keep you in pain so they can perpetually keep giving you pain management. And then that just works for everyone's bottom line. Yeah. I feel like this next generation is about the health of not just ourselves of our environment yeah and ultimately to be conscious of the little environments that we interact with so that those environments help the greater environment that we're all interacting with yeah nobody's talking about fukushima nobody's talking about really like what's going to happen when our oceans are polluted and has no fish like these are all the things like we can project it yeah do you remember um the housing crash in 2008, yeah. the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Yeah. Well, I was in the construction industry in the early 2000s when they were talking about what's going to happen in 20, 2008 when wow. all of these loans come. And there was this huge dialogue. They were like, oh my God, the economy is going to crash. But people knew that it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. We still did it. So are we on that same path? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And as just the regular everyday human who really I strive to be. Yeah, I just want to be a good dad. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good community member. I want to be a good human to the planet. Yeah, I want to try to live a life that 
isn't infringing upon the life of someone else. Yeah, I have a cell phone. It drives me crazy when I see these things, the kids in cobalt mines in Africa. Like, you know, to think like that is because all of us have this. It's a very fine line that we all play with every day. And I think it's how we just one at a time yeah, separate those strands that don't make us into what we want to be. Mm. Yeah. And for me, tarot was that strand that I really recognized is something that was really important. And so to have that a part of my life and part of my children's life that ties them to their ancestors is important. Yeah. And I, and I think as small as that is, you know, I think about this, the huli that we have today, because of how taro grows, you can't really save the seed stock. How you save it is you farm it. And so the only reason that we have huli today is because someone planted it in the generation before. Hmm. And if we don't do it, we literally just ensured that the generation ahead never even has a chance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our, the space that we currently hold in history, this is the crossroads. Yeah. Shit could go in a lot of different directions. And 100%. it's really going to be about the makeup of humanity and how well we can organize together to do good things. Yeah, 100%. So in closing, um, cause there's so much I want to ask and maybe I gotta get you back here again, because I mean, you, you have so much good insight, um, to the young guy, to the 20, the 18 year old, you, the 17 year old, you, someone is listening to this podcast. What would you tell them on what to fight for, how to get vision, how to, how to think different, how to get out of what they're, they're in, what would be your message to them? To get to where you now, you see the fruit of the suffering that you've done. You see the fruit. Like, how do they get there? If they're right now listening to this and feel like, I'm nobody, I can't do it, you know, what would you tell them? Well, I think I would say, first, look at your diet. What are you feeding yourself mentally? What are you feeding yourself physically? And what are you feeding yourself spiritually? And know what those are. And then look for the lowest hanging fruit. Mm. Yeah, everyone wants to make like this big change. We, we over assume what we can do in a short amount of time, but under assume what we do over a period of time. Yeah, and at 18, at 20, at 25, you just haven't lived life long enough to know what 10 years of doing something small every single day really has. Yeah, right. yeah. And so I think one, knowing what fuels you will help you. Yeah. If you're, if you're watching stuff that, that isn't taking you to where you need to go, well, you can change that. Yeah. If you're feeling depressed, but you're eating crappy, it's connected. Yeah, if you're eating healthy and you're feeling depressed, it's probably because you're not spiritually connected. Mm. Yeah, and prayer and manifestation are oftentimes one and the same. Yeah, sometimes you ask for what you need. Sometimes you state where you're going. Just put it out there into the universe, yeah? Like these are things that are like so critical in human evolution and existence. Like, why would we have a voice if that voice wasn't used to conjure goodness for ourselves and those around us. And I would say this, make time to sleep and dream. Mm. And to know that for all the great people in history, they all started not where they ended. Yeah. And somewhere along the lines, it was a dream that changed everything. That's good. So don't forget about the dreams. Know that you dream better when you eat well, when you put good stuff into your mental, and you have a spiritual connection. Then you know where to dream. Yeah, you're, you're well, I mean, it's just this whole capacity of dreaming. And man, when you can dream, it, it really helps. Well, it says that without a dream, you'll perish, right? 
And so without a dream, you're just going to, life is going to go by and the legacy, not investing in the future will be all gone. To the dream, my friend. To the Thank dream. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. I'm grateful. We're going to have you again because, again, love you uh, for all that. I want to show this real quick. Yeah, 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 real quick. Traditionally, poi was kept in a, in a wooden calabash. Yeah. Right? And it was kept, um, it was designed to be the perfect storage for poi. When 50% of your population dies, who's dying? It's your canoe builders, it's your calabash makers. Right, with the end of the production of the calabash, the next best thing was a German crock pot. They called it a Kelly Mania. And it was a clay pot that the Hawaiians used to store poi. Well, today those are not only hard to find, but are usually quite large. So I've been working with my friend um, Nakana from Mana Ceramics, and this is the third revision of the poi calabash and oh wow i brought you some poi for your family yeah you this has been wow. kept three weeks in no this way. calabash now this particular calabash right here is going to actually we're going to do um we're going to do a raffle for it we're going to have a showing on the big island next month um i tell you what when you eat this because of how it was stored it has taken its own life and it has cultured its own unique flavor. And it will be just, you know, the thing, this thing about poi that we keep coming back to. Yeah. It's like, where does your poi reside? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the more that we can build a home for it in our home and keep it well stocked and always have a bowl of poi, to me is the metaphor that the culture and the people will always exist and be here. Mm. Yeah. If there's always poi on the table. There's always a people that are making sure that it gets there. That's good. And I remember, this is like the age stuff you gave me, right? Oh my gosh, that was so good. Remember that? Oh, the pot yai? Yeah, the pot yai age. like the pot yai, but this is poi that is just meant to be wow. eaten as is. And I can tell you what, when you eat that right there, it's going to be, it's, it has such a complex earth flavor. It's like the best wine. When we talk about this, this is like we're going to <laughs> France and you're getting like the, the champagne that has been aged in this barrel or whatever it is that it goes through to to meet perfection the only thing closer would have been had i taken out of the bag and just left it in here and we've been eating out of this wow so thank you so much i appreciate it enjoy that all right guys thank you so much for watching this episode this is the third podcast more is coming share this podcast let more ears hear about Danny anthony and just really his mission his passion uh, and just like and subscribe. We're also on Spotify. We're on YouTube. And obviously we'll throw out snippets on, on social media. So aloha.